Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and there's Jerry, and this is Stuff You Should Know. Okay? Deal with it. (laughs) Yeah. Up your nose, etc. Um, Rubber hose? Yeah. I just suddenly... (laughs) You know why I stopped saying that quote mid, mid quote? Because uh, I, I suddenly know. felt like an old dinosaur, Chuck, and that probably nobody knew what I was talking about. <laughs> and I'm oh, tired no. of feeling old, Chuck. Are you feeling old? I feel young. I'm glad. To answer your question, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, hey, before we get started, um, this is going to be a really good episode, uh, and I want to enhance it by saying I I finally saw, I got to see my niece's uh, movie that I've been talking nonstop about, No Exit. How was it? It's amazing. It's such a great, I would call it a popcorn thriller. Okay. Um, like, you know, it's not like high art. It's not trying to be high art, but it's it's like really well done. The script doesn't have a bunch of like holes in it. Uh, nice. It doesn't, like they've trimmed off all the fat. It moves along really nicely. Um, and once it gets going, it keeps like, getting going again and, like, these lurches forward and just – it it doesn't go off the rails, but it's just like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is going on right now. And then to to be able to see my niece, Mila, act as, like, the kid in this, it, the, to cool see her, that? like, do this stuff, it, it's just – it's amazing, dude. First of all, and I'm, I'm, like, removing – I've done everything I can to remove any subjectivity as a proud uncle – and, like, actually watch her acting and, like, the performance she gives. And it is great. It's amazing. She does an amazing job. She has to do a bunch of different stuff. She gets, like, tortured and harassed and beat up on and everything. Um, it's actually a really graphic movie in a lot of ways, but, like, delightfully, if you ask me. Um, <laughs> and she did She did a great job. And I thought the whole cast did a really good job, too. Including, that sounds great. It is good. Including uh, Havana Rose Lou, by the way. But yes, it is It is a great movie, and I recommend anybody who watches our movies to watch the movie, and uh, it's on It's on Hulu right now, streaming. It's called No Exit. Awesome. Can't wait to watch it. I was, I've been traveling. I went on the road for a bit. Once again, seeing more Bonnie Prince Billy and Matt Sweeney Super Wolf shows. Matt Sweeney, is that the girlfriend guy? What? The guy who had that hit in the 90s called Girlfriend? No. No. Uh. <laughs> He's local. That was uh, that was a great album. Uh, I can't think of his name. No, Matt Sweeney's a, a genuine uh, Stuff You Should Know listener. And super smart, awesome guy, and we're kind of pals now, so he's mm. always kind enough to hang out. And he always sends me really good ideas for the show. Neat. But uh, that's not my ninth sh- Bonnie Prince Billy show in the past, like, year and a half. I'm going to where he goes. That's really cool. He doesn't come to Atlanta, so I just, I'm hitting the road. And uh, along with uh, our good friend Joey Ciara, he came on this one. Oh, yeah, that's right. I saw that post on Instagram. That's awesome to see Joey. He's looking good. Yeah, he says hello, and uh, if you want to see pictures of this and uh, of my travels and travails, you can follow me Aww. at uh, Chuck the Podcaster on Instagram. I'm sorry you had travails. Uh, what did I say? Travails? Did I not say travels? You said travels and travails. Oh, no, no travails. Only oh, travels. Oh, good, good. <laughs> it was only good times. I'm sure I've told you before, but I always love rubbing it in. Did I ever tell you that I saw Bonnie Prince Billy doing karaoke at our friend Toby's wedding years back? I don't know that you told me that. Do you know what song it was? It was some, like, sweet old country song he did a duet with, I think, maybe his wife. Oh, my God. I mean, he's he's my favorite vocalist. He's, to me, the best singer, literally, in music history. And a cool dude, I can tell you, because I've been in the same room with him plenty of times. Uh, Me too. I was four feet from him the other night. (laughs) (laughs) That's really cool. Uh, anyway, shout out to Sweeney, shout out to No Exit, and now let's talk about <laughs> a time when the U.S. government was not above uh, planning false flag operations that were crazy and ludicrous and planning potentially to assassinate the leaders of other countries uh, uh, hundreds of years ago. Oh, actually, no, this was way back in the 1960s. Yeah, planning, that's the operative word here is planning doesn't mean that, like, any false flag operation was ever carried out, uh, at least by the United States government. There have been plenty of false flag operations carried out, most recently, um, apparently by Russia, 
mm-hmm. who was trying to accuse U- Ukraine of doing, like, sabotage and bombing across the border as a pretext for invasion. And that's generally the point of a false flag operation, which we should probably define it. But it's basically where you dress up as the um, somebody from the country that you want to invade— have them or you assault your own, like, border crossing, your own military installation, your own railroad, and then you publicize to the world how that country attacked you, and now you're going to have to go in and invade in, in, you know, for your own, your own welfare and the welfare of your own country. That's a false flag operation. That's right. Staging any kind of a fake operation. Uh, the, it originally came about the term uh, false flag from pirates, would fly a flag of a friendly country to lure ships closer than they would attack them. But since then, and Russia is big on it, they've, uh, I mean, uh, Japan has done this, Germany has done this, uh, but the Soviets and Russia, uh, like you said, they're, they're still uh, gangbusters for this kind of thing. Yes. I also think as just a PSA, if you are currently um, feeling sympathetic or, um, you know, absorbing information that makes you th- see things through Putin's view, mm-hmm. you're probably being manipulated online. Just yes, FYI, you, you may want to you may want to look a little deeper into that and pull your head out of that particular rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go back in time uh, and talk about Operation Northwoods. Uh, but to talk about Operation Northwoods, we have to first talk about who did this one for us. By the way, who put this together? Uh, this was a Livia joint. Livia Gershon. Great mm-hmm. work. Yeah. Uh, we need to talk about uh, Cuba and what the threat that that country started to pose or the seeming threat that country started to pose to the United States uh, in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Yeah, because uh, Castro came to power in 1959. And in doing so, he became the first um, – he established the first communist regime in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, in America's backyard, as it would later be put. And That's right. this is not settled well with the Americans because at the time we were, um, I, I guess, our military um, brass, our intelligence community, basically everybody in charge with security for America um, was of the of the of the ilk that like we should be invading other countries that are communist and toppling those regimes and fighting communism wherever it pops up. No, no country's too small. No country's too large. We need to invade them and fight them and remove those communists and, and probably install like a, a democratic government from that point on, which is kind of ironic. That's right. By the way, that was Matthew Sweet. That's what I said. What did you say? Oh, Matt, Matt, Matt Sweeney. Matt Sweeney, but it came to me. When I was uh, when you were talking about Cuba, I went mm-hmm. Matthew Sweet because that's a great record. Yeah, I this. can't remember the song how it goes, but I know it was a good song. I don't think I ever heard the record. It had a cool video too. Yeah, want me to sing it? Yeah. <laughs> I want to love somebody. Remember that? That's it. I think I need somebody to love. Yeah. That's okay. The, and then the chorus is, uh, "You need to uh, get back in the arms of a girlfriend." Oh yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty good song. It's not as good as I remember. (laughs) Just by the Super Wolves record. It's better. Um, All right. So good setup on Cuba. Uh, If you want to go back, well, um, I don't even know how much we need to go over it, but if you want to go back and listen to our, uh, I think, pretty great episode from November 10th, 2020, uh, called The Bay of Pigs Disaster. Yeah. This was sort of one of the first things that happened in the 1960s when uh, Eisenhower uh, approved this boondoggle of an operation uh, known as the Bay of Pigs invasion that just went just about as wrong as it could go on every level. Yeah. And so, like, we were setting up fake invasions of cu- Cuba or supporting exiles, invasions of Cuba. Um, RFK and JFK were obsessed with Cuba and, in particular, removing Castro from power. Cuba was a big deal for a number of reasons, we should say. And one of the leading reasons that Cuba was a problem for the United States is because they were worried Castro was going to serve as an inspiration for other countries in Latin America, uh, right. especially the economically depressed ones, um, where they're like, yeah, all this, this capitalism running around where Americans own most of our national operations and exports, and we're getting very little in return. 
communism might seem pretty appealing to them. So Castro might serve as an inspiration. And if there's like that domino effect like they were worried about in Southeast Asia that happens in Latin America thanks to Cuba, all of a sudden America's American businesses are going to be out a lot of money. Americans are going to be out a lot of the bananas that they've come to love thanks to Edward Bernays. Yeah. And we would also lose access to things like the Panama Canal and other mm-hmm. things we need. So it wasn't just like a um, like a, a an ideological yeah. problem. It was a practical problem too. But the biggest problem, the biggest problem that a communist Cuba posed to the United States is that it was now an ally with the USSR, America's sworn enemy, the mm-hmm. other polar power of the Cold War, yeah, would now had a, a a country that would be willing to let them set up nuclear missile bases a hundred miles from Florida. That was truly the big problem with Cuba and Castro. That's right, and uh, because of that, kind of from the very beginning, the U.S. very quietly started thinking about like, hey, should we assassinate this guy? Should we depose this guy? Um, and there were all kinds of crazy, like, poison cigars, like mafia hitmen. That kind of stuff was being talked about mm-hmm. behind closed doors, uh, including um, Florida Senator George Smathers. Great name. Uh, <laughs> he proposed assassinating Castro. He was a good buddy of Kennedy's and brought it up during the 1960 presidential campaign, and which included – the plan included a false flag attack uh, at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base. And he claims that Kennedy – Basically was like, uh, uh, put something down on paper and I'll take a look. And um, so Kennedy wasn't, you know, if you believe this, he wasn't initially adverse or averse, excuse me, to the idea of taking care of the problem, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, that's how obsessed he was with removing Castro. Yeah. The problem was this. After the Bay of Pigs, that was what, 1961, I believe? Yeah, it was April 1961. Um, the one of the the huge problems with it, aside from America having an enormous amount of egg on its face for being outed for supporting a, a failed coup of Castro, um, was that Kennedy had been led to believe by his military and intelligence advisors that there was going to be an uprising. That like right. these exiles showing up. Having making a couple of wins against the Castro regime was going to like awaken the Cuban people who would want to go back to you know the way things were before the communists came along and took over the country, and there'd be an uprising that toppled Castro. That was the thing. They weren't necessarily trying to take over the country; they're trying to incite a revolution. Yeah, and that did not happen. It was supposed to work. <laughs> yeah, even though Kennedy had been told up and down by these advisors, he was a yeah. brand new president at the time, and he had been told up and down by these advisors that that was going to happen, and it didn't happen. It never materialized, and so he lost full faith in any military or intelligence advisor around him at the time from that point on. So he found he needed to surround himself with new people to take on this this Castro-Cuba problem. And the point man he put on the whole thing, he basically said, uh, I want you to, to be in charge of getting rid of Castro, and, you know, figuring out how to do it without sending in military people, was his brother Bobby. That's right. Uh, like you said, Kennedy still had that new president smell. <laughs> And Bobby still had that new attorney general smell. You were very, uh, very patient and waiting for your, <laughs> your chance to use that. And I think it paid off in aces. Okay, good. I, I mean, I, was, I tried to get in there, but, you know. It was good. Uh, so Bobby it was attorney general, like I said. And that isn't, you know, attorney attorney general or attorneys general. Um, nice. Or would it be attorneys generals? <laughs> they usually don't get involved in stuff like this. But yeah. he was his his brother. And so he trusted him, and he ended up overseeing something called Operation Mongoose, which was kind of this crazy idea that they could disrupt life in Cuba such that uh, with, you know, sabotage, with disorder, with espionage, um, and it would all be just in the name of stirring things up with the Cubans themselves. Again, not like putting in Americans dressed as Cubans and stuff like that. Uh, They thought they could get this done. Um, the CIA was going to be involved, the State Department was going to be involved, um, the Defense Department, what we had at the time, the U.S. Information Agency. And basically, they were going to get together and get this done, and it was going to be headed up by uh, a a general from the Air Force named Edward Lansdale, 
who was interestingly a former ad exec and a CIA operative. And he was sort of in charge along with Kennedy of getting this thing planned. And this is Operation Mongoose again. Yeah. So Operation Mongoose is that operation that like all the wacky stuff that you have ever heard about getting rid of Castro, like a poisoned skin suit for him to scuba dive in or exploding <laughs> cigars. All that is Operation Mongoose. And like you're saying, the point was to— <laughs> I think it was a poison cigar. I don't think it was an exploding cigar. That's like a novelty item. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that was the level they were at. Somebody brought up Joy Buzzer once. Right. They were like, poison, exploding cigar won't kill him. They're like, yeah, but it'll humiliate him. <laughs> right. And we'll finish him off with the Joy Buzzer. That's right. Um, so that that's all of that fell under Operation Mongoose. And like you said, they were trying to basically make— life for the average Cuban so weird and disjointed and uncomfortable without anybody realizing the Americans were actually behind all these yeah. seemingly unrelated things that they would just get rid of Castro themselves. And that was the the, the reason why they weren't just like, well, we can't just go in and kill Castro is because, again, they were friends of the Soviets. And there was a chance that um, JFK believed uh, th- if they did invade Cuba— they would set off World War III. Like, that was a very real th- fear. Sure. On the other hand, there was also this ticking clock going at, at all moments. Uh, in, in Among some people, some advisors to the White House, some security advisors, it was, like, deafening, the sound of this clock ticking, mm-hmm. that the longer we waited, the the more chance there was going to be that the Cubans were going to say, hey, Soviets, come build a missile base here. They hadn't yet, but it was on the table and everybody knew it. So they the Americans needed to do something about Castro and fast. So the idea that the Americans could come up with these plots to get the Cubans to overthrow Castro themselves, that takes a lot of time. It might not pay off. And then looming in the background, getting ever closer, are these Soviet missile bases arriving in Cuba any day now. They just knew it. All right, that's a great suspenseful lead up to our first break. We're going to come back and find out what happened with Operation Mongoose right after this. So you set the stage very well, my friend. Thanks. Uh, General Lansdale is running the show. It was uh, a pretty impossible situation to try and do this with the Cuban people without any real uh, power, basically. Like, he didn't have any real teeth in this. No. Uh, He was overseeing a bunch of different agencies. Uh, And in February of 62, he basically put forward a plan that was supposed to get Castro out of office by October. Uh, even though he said that was pretty optimistic. And some of these ideas were pretty crazy. Um, one of them was that there's these things called star shells, which is kind of how you how you light up the night sky during wartime. Yeah, with phosphorescence, uh, it, I think. Yeah, it's like you shoot it for, as it, it were a mortar round, but it's not mortar round. It just lights things up for the night vision goggles, or mm-hmm. back then, I guess. Well, I don't know if they had them back then. but It's like that one scene at night, that battle, the night battle in Apocalypse Now. Yeah. Exactly. So one of the ideas was for a submarine, a U.S. submarine, to fire these star shells off the coast and convince the Cubans that the second coming of Jesus was was happening and that Jesus was against Castro. Yeah, they were going to shoot it off on All Saints Day, and it was based on the premise that the that Cubans were deeply, deeply Catholic and that they would see this as a sign. And these are just ideas again. They never did this. All of these are just ideas but they were ideas that were literally put forth in writing by the U.S. government to the president. So, so okay, so the clock is ticking on Lansdale. And I read that basically every week he would go to the, the Oval Office and ask to be taken off of this assignment. Oh, really? Yeah, he was apparently a golden child. Like you said, he was an ad exec and a CIA operative. He basically shaped the geopolitical map of Southeast Asia by himself in the 50s. Yeah. Um, and... They, the Kennedys were like, hey, you seem pretty great at this. Let's see what you can do at Cuba. And he just ran into a brick wall in Cuba. In no small part because, like you were saying, the Kennedys didn't give him any teeth, any authority. So he had to beg for everything from everybody. 
from this this multi agency task force that he was in charge of. It was a terrible, terrible thing. And then again, that clock is ticking. So in addition to coming up with ways to get the Cubans to topple Castro, Lansdale also was trying to figure out how to justify overt action, an actual military invasion. Right. And so he asked the Joint Chiefs, uh, who were one of the agencies that were part of the task force he oversaw, for some some info on that. Like, what would it take, do you think, for the United States to be able to justifiably invade Cuba and remove Castro as its leader, problem solved? And again— yeah, like, how can I scare the president bad enough, kind of? Yeah, right, exactly. So they—well, they, they well, no, also, like, I think he was also trying to figure out what we could do to make that happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, could we also— like push Cuba into a corner and make them do something, it would be like, oh, well, we ha- our hands are tied. We have to invade. Um, but the reason that it would scare Kennedy too is like he was against military action. You just got to keep that in mind. After the Bay of Pigs, he said, no, we're not invading Cuba. So now Lansdale's trying to figure out basically how to, wh- how to change the president's mind. And I guess, yeah, like you were saying, if it meant through scaring him, Whatever it took, he just wanted out of this stupid assignment where he's trying to figure out how to trick the Cubans into overthrowing Castro. Right. So this this is what this briefing was all about in February of 1962 from the Joint Chiefs of Staff to basically put, put it forth that this cannot be ignored. Uh, the quote was, the communist regime in Cuba is incompatible with the minimum security requirements of the Western Hemisphere. Um, I mean, that's like, that sentence kind of kind of says it all, like, we're we're <laughs> he it is incompatible having him in power with the safety of the Western Hemisphere, so we got to get rid of him. Um, they said that that uh, we can't count on like you see what happened with the Bay of Pigs. There is no insurgents happening in Cuba that we can count on basically at this point. Right. Yeah, and we need to intervene directly. And uh, I don't think Russia will even like be super mad at this point yet. Yeah, yet. That was the thing, because they said that Cuba is not part of the Warsaw Pact, which is kind of like the Soviet Union's version of NATO. Um, And since they weren't a member of that, the Soviet Union had no obligations to back them up if they were invaded by America. And the fact that they didn't have any military bases there meant they also didn't have any reason to back up Cuba. So it was possible that if they invaded Cuba to to topple Castro, they the Soviets would not be drawn into it. Maybe JFK was wrong about it right. sparking World War III. They didn't know that for a fact, but that was their assessment of it, right? Yeah. So uh, on February 2nd, Brigadier General William H. Craig, he was the Joint Chief of Staff's rep for Operation Mongoose, He submitted this memo to Lansdale that said it was called Possible Actions to Provoke, Harass, and Disrupt Cuba. And this is where some of these uh, really kind of wacky ideas start coming forth. Um, Some not quite so wacky, like the Mercury mission was about to happen with John Glenn later that month. And they were like, hey, if anything goes wrong with this thing, we could basically manufacture proof that Cuba was behind it. And that would give us a reason. Yeah. That like was it, one of the more reasonable things in there. <laughs> it really was. There was Operation Free Ride, the idea that they were going to drop one-way tickets to, um, like, Mexico City over Havana. For I love this just, idea. Like, just leave. <laughs> That's amazing. I guess that was one. If Castro had no one to rule, then maybe he would just leave himself. Castro would just shut down the airports or something. Yeah. You yeah, know, that it, was not very well thought out. It wouldn't have worked, no. There was also Operation Good Times, too, mm-hmm. which was they were going <laughs> to produce a fake photo, and this is at a time when it was hard to do that, at least make a convincing one, of Castro, presumably naked, uh, hanging out with, <laughs> with uh, beautiful women and a bunch of food at uh-huh. a time when, you know, the the Cubans were having a lot of trouble putting food on their own plates. And this picture was going to have Castro surrounded by food and women, and they were going to caption it, my ration is different. <laughs> And they thought Operation that that would just that times. would be it for Castro. So yes, these it. are the ideas that they were coming up with. But when they when they kind of turn their, I think when they said like, "Wow, these are the ideas we're coming up with. This stuff's not going to work. There's no counter revolutionary insurgency to spark in Cuba. Like, what are we going to do? We need to figure out how to how to get our army in there. Right, get army in there, and then uh, that kind of set the table. All of us set the table 
for Operation Northwoods, which was put forward uh, by Army General Lyon. It's so funny. I'm glad that that Livia mentioned uh, Dr. Strangelove, which had not come out yet because Mm -hmm. some of the names in this are very – like you can kind of tell that – uh, Kubrick and the writer were very much influenced by like real stuff that was going on <laughs> for sure. With some of the ridiculous names from Dr. Strangelove. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, later on when we get to like what was actually in Northwoods, it, the, the, you can only hear it as if it was read from uh, George C. E. Scott, General Buck Turgenson. <laughs> uh, like you can hear him saying these things, but uh, Army General Lyman Limnitzer <laughs> was this guy's name. And he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1960. Very hawkish, to say the least, right-wing guy who, uh, I mean, this guy, he wanted to attack everybody at all times. He wanted a preemptive nuclear war launched against the Soviet Union at one point. That was a proposal that he took to Kennedy. He proposed that in writing. He said, "We here's a plan to, to for a surprise attack against the USSR. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, he was that kind of guy. He was one of those ones that I mentioned earlier. Fight communism everywhere it pops up, anytime it pops up, just invade and take over. That's That was like his his plan. This guy's running the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yeah. So Kennedy didn't like, like him though, right? The head, no. He was an Eisenhower appointee. Kennedy didn't like him, and he didn't like Kennedy, uh, especially after the Bay of Pigs. He was one of the people that Kennedy did not trust. And then he thought Kennedy was reprehensible for not— ordering an airstrike to back up the Bay of Pigs ex- exile invaders. Right. Um, so there was no love lost. But Lansdale was, it sounds like kind of appropriately the guy to come up with Operation Northwoods, which was, as far as we have as in documentary evidence, the only false flag operation the United States ever came up with. Okay. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Documented evidence. I don't think yeah. there's ever been evidence of anything like this. I mean, there was a there was a historian who wrote about it later, a journalist, who said it was probably the most corrupt document the United States government's ever come up with. Right. Which is really saying something. I no, mean, I'm not true. so I'm not Pollyanna here. I don't think the U.S. government has, of course, clean hands and is just you know looking out for the good of everybody at all yeah. the time. Like I think. It's done some deeply shady stuff, but I also personally think that Operation Northwoods may have been, as far as planning goes, the pinnacle of that shadiness. Right. Yeah. I so like March, to think at least. I believe it too. Uh, March 5th, the Joint Chiefs, uh, Lansdale issued a request to them to provide a, quote, brief but precise description of pretext which they would consider uh, would provide justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba was passed along. On March 5th, I'm sorry, March 13th, uh, Limnitzer passes it to uh, Defense Secretary Robert S. McNamara. And uh, this is something that uh, McNamara, you know, years later was kind of like, I don't know. Uh, Was that a thing? I don't really remember that. Yeah, he Uh, said I'm not really sure that was true. He was a scumbag (laughs) himself, too. Yeah, I recommend the great, great documentary by uh, Errol Morris when he talks to uh, Robert McNamara, basically. Fog of War? Uh, yeah, for 90 minutes straight or however long it is. It's crazy what he got him to say and to see. I know. And, and he tried <laughs> to get him to see. And McNamara is like, does not compute to yeah, immoral. It was really fascinating stuff. Yeah, it really was. I didn't realize that was Errol Morris. I should have guessed, though. Yeah, the master. That's so good. Yeah. Um, I right, loved so th- Midnight Cowboy. What? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to throw you. I wanted to sniff you off the case. You sure did. Uh, so this memo was called "Justification for U.S. Military Intervention in Cuba." That was the official title, uh, signed by Limnitzer and the Joint Chiefs. And you know, this this was basically uh, here. What do you think of this plan? Um, it's you might think it's wacky, and we've never done anything quite like this officially. But here it is, President Kennedy. Right. Kennedy said, "Or um, let me see that." Hey, not bad. No, that was pretty bad. <laughs> so um, he looked it over, said, nope, thank you very much. I, I appreciate you going to all this trouble, but I reject this out of hand. We're not going to to create some sort of um, mayhem, blame it on the Cubans, and then use it as a pretext to invade. We're just not doing that. And right when that happened, right when he realized that, that this is not going to— um, not going to uh, be implemented. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lemnitzer um, 
tried to get all documentation of this destroyed. He wasn't yeah. successful, as we'll see, <laughs> obviously, because we're talking about it now. He's but like, he was can like, we torch this? Oh, God, I signed that thing. Yeah. <laughs> I thought we were all going to do this. And in fact, in the Operation Northwoods memo, he talks about how uh, he anticipates that other agencies that were all part of Operation Mongoose Task Force um, would be submitting similar proposals, which are basically ideas for how to make it look like Cuba attacked the United <laughs> States so that we can invade Cuba. And it turned out he was the only one who put his name on a document that he then handed into the president that was that. <laughs> it's sort of like the, the scene in like an army movie where they ask for volunteers and everyone but one person takes a step back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love and that. then one guy's left standing there. Have you ever seen, there's a video of some dogs that did that to another dog. There's three dogs. I think they're all little poodles. Uh-huh. Yeah. And one of them, Peter, pooped on the staircase. And the mom is making the video, is asking them, like, who did this? <laughs> and right when she says, who did this, the other two look at the third one. Oh, man. And then she said, who did it? And they take a step <laughs> back, and the one's just standing there still. It's one of the most amazing dog videos I've ever seen. I saw a nature video the other day that uh, was a deer uh, that, you know, how they had like fake deer and things in the woods. Mm -hmm. That was a real deer that had mounted one of these fake deer. Have you seen that? I've seen pictures, you know, on the internet. So it has mounted this deer and it's kind of going at it. And the the fake deer's um, sort of from the neck up, it's pieced together. That whole section falls off. (laughs) This deer jumps off of the back of that thing and like... I wish there was, like, a human narration going on because it looks at, like, it's kind of circling this thing, looking at it like, <laughs> oh yeah, what was I just doing uh, this thing to? Right. So we figured out this it was act. fake. It oh, wasn't I would like, say so. I killed you. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's good stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, should we take a break before we <laughs> get into the absurdity of Operation Northwoods? Yes. All right. We'll take our second break, and we'll talk about some of these uh, crazy, wacky ideas right after this. Chuck, I think, you know, we're, we're calling these crazy, wacky ideas, and they are crazy, wacky ideas. Like, you shouldn't do stuff like false flag operations and invade countries based on them. Um, but they're also, I think, only crazy, wacky because they were in the 60s. Mm-hmm. They were directed at Cuba, which makes it seem even wackier in hindsight now today. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, um, they weren't implemented of Had course. they been implemented, they would there would be in no way, shape, or form crazy or wacky. They'd be, you know, abhorrent. But yeah, I mean, we're kind of laughing about this stuff now, but it, it, it's really not funny. No, that's what I'm trying to do. Stop yeah. laughing. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, all right, so let's talk about some of these false flag operations. Again, um, signed by General Lyman Leimnitzer. That's right. Uh, we already talked about sort of attacking Guantanamo. Uh, we, there are things called over-the-fence attacks, uh, which were uniformed uh, Cubans um, basically, you know, riding near the bases, throwing firebombs inside the base, setting aircraft on fire, mm-hmm. uh, kind of giving the illusion that, that Guantanamo is under direct attack. And these would probably be exiled Cubans who were um, sent from Florida down to Guantanamo to pose as Cuban nationals under Castro who were attacking. Yeah. Um, but they would be paid. And then, remember that movie Wag the Dog? Oh, sure. They would probably be whacked afterward. Yeah. That's the thing, though. And this is, if you read, if you read the fine print, aside from one of them, these are all basically elaborate ruses where no one actually dies. Yes. That's very important. That I know a lot of people... Believe, I was going to say suspect, I, I think believe is a is much more correct word, mm-hmm. that, that um, September 11th was a false flag attack. Um, yeah, some people I, think I, that. I mean, I get that. I get, uh, I get believing that and why you would believe that. Um, but I, if you look at Operation Northwoods, they, they go 
out of their way to basically stage death. People don't actually die. They weren't part of the plan killing people. And then let alone the idea of killing thousands of Americans. The, just the fact that that many people died. I don't believe that anyone has ever held power in America that is capable or willing to kill that, that many Americans all at once. Wow. I just don't believe it. I, I, don't, I don't think the world works that way. I think the world can be a very, very dark place. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's that dark. At least yeah. th- th- that there's like that depth of betrayal from, you know, the American government to the American people. I just, I don't believe it. I agree. So I thought we probably should at least mention 2001 as a f- false flag operation. That's right. There it is. Uh, another one from this era was the Remember the Main incident, which was basically, let's just blow up one of our ships in Guantanamo Bay mm-hmm. uh, or or another vessel um, near Cuba. We could, like, they, they proposed sinking ships and all kinds of crazy plans like that. Uh, the one that really speaks to me as far as George C. Scott uh, reading it from uh, Dr. Strangelove is uh, this direct quote. We could sink a boatload of Cubans en route to Florida, real or simulated. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, they could could be dummies, or we could actually really do this with real humans. That was the one that I was like, okay, there's not, there's not like, uh, like that actually does overtly say, yeah, we could kill some people. The other ones, the ones that I'm like, okay, they're really going out of their way to make sure nobody is actually hurt, are ones like, um, there was one where they were going to... uh, um, send a, uh, like a charter plane, like actual, like a commercial airliner from the U.S., probably from Florida, mm-hmm. on route to somewhere carrying um, American tourists off to vacation, like Jamaica, Venezuela, Guatemala, all the vacation hotspots, right? Mm-hmm. And they were going to release actually two planes at once, identical planes, except one of them was going to be dr- a drone, remote-controlled plane. And then they were going to reroute the uh, the one with the actual people in it and then send the drone along over Cuban airspace and blow it up and then blame it on the Cubans. Yeah. So if you'll notice in that plan, there's like all those people are safe. They're all fine. Like they're all, they're, they're safe. This is all a decoy. Um, Like that's, that's, that's what this, this operation was, was, like it still wouldn't just it, they wouldn't say or they weren't they weren't saying like yeah we'll just blow up a plane full of tourists like it, it just doesn't happen that doesn't happen yeah but i mean some of the stuff to me like has the could serve as setting the stage for things getting out of hand and leading to real bloodshed like they had ideas for a simulated cuban back to salt on like dominican republic or something using fake aircraft you know painted up to look like cuban aircraft yeah uh I mean, all of a sudden, something like that gets out of hand and real lives are being lost when it's well, misinterpreted. Yes, and I mean, that's a really good point. And also, like, the whole basis of this is, like, so we can invade Cuba. And when we invade Cuba, there's going to be a lot of loss of life and bloodshed from that invasion, too. So even if we went out of our way to make sure the people who were in the false flag operation didn't actually get hurt, somebody's eventually going to die because of this false flag, these ideas that this guy came up with. Yeah. it's a good uh, point. Another idea was uh, a fake attack on a plane, like a U.S. Air Force plane in international waters. So uh, basically that would be uh, a pilot who was uh, flying as, you know, under an alias. Uh, they would broadcast over the radio that they had been jumped by MiGs, which was, I guess, this, the Soviet uh, fighter jets. Mm-hmm. I saw Top Gun. I know this stuff. Sure. Uh, and it would fly, I guess, under the radar at a low altitude and land uh, safely. And then stored, the paint would be um, repainted, given a new tail number, and then a submarine would drop uh, plane parts into the water where it supposedly happened so they could, like, pull those things out of the ocean. Yes. Show the world. Again, totally fake. Totally fake. Um, There were other ones where, like, they're like, well, maybe we could injure Cuban exiles in Miami, like, assault them and blame it on the Cubans, um, et cetera, et cetera, like, Basically, anything you could think of uh, that could give America a reason to say, look, this Castro regime is unpredictable, unstable, and they're now attacking us, um, we're going to have to invade. 
Uh, that was the point of Operation Northwood's ideas. But it had a bit of a stroke of genius that was kind of hidden in there a little bit that I thought was was kind of well put. It was using a number of these different things, making them seem through, you know, a separation of, of in time and space, making them seem like unrelated events. Yeah. Also staging other events, too, that didn't necessarily have anything to do with anything to kind of, like, give cover and camouflage the actual events and the goals. Mm -hmm. Um, And that if you put it all together, the U.S. could be like, look at how crazy this Castro regime is. We're going to have to invade. I thought that was, as far as unhinged documents go, I thought that was a little bit of sanity shining in it. Yeah, I mean, I think they should have dropped those one-way plane tickets. That was <laughs> right. that was my favorite idea out of all yeah, this stuff. Totally. Uh, so uh, you know, we know that Kennedy didn't accept this proposal. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis unfolds in October '62, mm-hmm. and Operation Mongoose was sort of fully uh, laid to rest. And uh, Lansdale, for his efforts, uh, he was replaced um, by. Uh, a man named Sterling Cottrell, nice who was um, he wasn't like an insider for the for the Kennedy clan, and so he was a little more cautious about everything. Um, they were still, you know, I, I think the Joint Chiefs had the idea like they didn't put this idea to bed completely. They put Operation Mongoose, Operation Mon- Mongoose, Mongoose down, but uh, they still didn't like put to bed the idea that like, hey, maybe we should still provoke Cuba and see if we can, like, set them up to invade. Um, Like, that went through 63. Yeah, all the way through 1963, the Hawks were just trying to figure out how to get it done. Uh, And it it obviously didn't happen. And what somebody pointed out in one of these, the articles that were the sources for Olivia's article was, like, Castro's still there. He outlived all these guys. (laughs) I know, man. Uh, and I think it was in like the 90s or the, the early 2000s when the article was written. They're like, he's still there. He's still giving seven-hour speeches and like all these people are long dead. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, that's the case. Like America and Cuba just entered this kind of, its own like kind of mini Caribbean Cold War uh, with tons of sanctions against Cuba and, and um, limits on travel. Um, and, that, you know, I think the average American – uh, would just not really understand why they just know that Q, that Castro was a communist and, you know, that was all you needed to know to, to place sanctions on Cuba. Um, and we even further would have no idea whatsoever that Operation Northwood uh, ever happened, was ever proposed, if it wasn't for Oliver Stone's 1992 movie or 1991 movie JFK. Isn't that a neat little bizarre footnote? Yeah, it really is, because like you said, Lemnitzer tried to get this thing completely destroyed, not even like, hey, can we bury this? Like, let's destroy it. Uh, there was an investigative reporter named James Banford who wrote a lot about this that called it the most corrupt plan ever created by the U.S. government. And if not for Oliver Stone, sort of that JFK movie was so popular uh, for like Americans after that calling for mm-hmm. the release and like opening of records, mm-hmm. um, we we may never have known. So, hey. Yeah. Holly Stone. Yeah, he got a, a act of Congress passed f- through his movie. That's how popular that movie was when it came out. Yeah. It'd be like like passing the Hobbit Act or something right. back in like 2007. <laughs> Ooh, to, me- to never make another Hobbit movie would be that act. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, or another eight-hour Beatles documentary. How about that? Ouch. Uh, well, since Chuck said ouch, everybody, that's it for Operation Northwoods, which means it's time for listener mail. Man, I mean, just hostility toward the Beatles here at the end. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see that coming, huh? Outright hostility. I get the Peter Jackson link, but... Mm. All right, I'm going to call this uh, from a night shift nurse. Doing great work. Nice. Uh, hey, guys, my husband recently introduced me to your podcast. About two years into the backlog and loving it. I started with your most recent pod uh, and worked backwards, but my husband scrolls through and picks one at random, Russian roulette style, which seems insane to me. I've been trying to figure out if our listening style says anything about our personalities. Uh, I would say I'm a little more methodical, and he's more spontaneous in life, so maybe there's something to that. Yeah. So, Lindsay, uh, 1,000%. I mean, your husband is uh, flying by the seat of his pants, it sounds like. Yeah. Fast and loose. He's like, yeah, let's hear what they have to say about stupid grass. Yeah. 
You know what we had to say? A lot. <laughs> we did. That was a long episode. And, you know, we've talked about this before. We There is no wrong way to listen to any show, uh, including Stuff You Should Know. Right. I We personally sort of endorse the sandwiching idea, which is if you're new to the show, listen to the most recent release, because that way, sometimes they're timely, but um, at least you're in the know about current jokes and things we're referencing and uh, if we have live shows going on like people miss out on kind of information release uh, mm-hmm. and then so you sandwich so you listen to the most recent and then you pick one from the backpack catalog the deep web mm-hmm. no 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 not the deep web <laughs> no. <laughs> no so we've endorsed that but there's no wrong way to listen you can be one well, of those two times as fast uh, play our voices two times as fast weirdos I think that's wrong to. That's the one one that's wrong. Just hit download, you know? I'm just teasing. No, it's right. (laughs) However you listen, it's great. It's weird, I think, to listen to us as if we were the chipmunks, but... Yeah, I think it's funny, though, too. If that's your jam, then go for it. Watch this. I think it's funny, though, too. (laughs) It's going to be like four times when they get to that part. That's right. I love it. Or maybe we should do this. (laughs) Ah, ah, ah. (laughs) What are you, John Wayne? No, but sped up at two times, it'd sound like myself. Right. But yeah, that was a John Wayne, wasn't it? <laughs> that was great, Chuck. Uh, Man, you just brought a smile to my face. Good. All right, let me finish this up. Uh, anyway, I'm a night shift nurse. I listen to podcasts, especially on my way home from work, <laughs> to decompress from my shift. Thank you for keeping me company on my drive, keeping me awake after working these long hours. Find your voice is soothing yet engaging. I uh, really admire that uh, you can do that and admit when you were wrong as well which is such a hard thing to do in these polarizing times. Yeah. And that is from uh, Lindsay Johnson, MSNRN. Nice. Thank you, Lindsay, doing God's work out there. We appreciate you, and we appreciate your husband also for introducing you to us. So I don't know what he's for... doing, but... Hey, man, who, whatever he's doing is fine with me. Agreed. Um, if you want to be like Lindsay and get in touch with us, we would love that. You can send us an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.